Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you for joining us today. Hopefully many of you joined us yesterday for the IIS Town Hall. If not, a recording of the day will be available soon on our website. Today we have two great panels lined up. We will start with a panel on embedding climate risk management in the insurance sector, which is a key strategic focus for the International Association of Insurance Supervisors. The panel will be moderated by Jeff Summerhays, an EXCO member, member of the executive board of the Australian Prudential Regulatory Authority, and who is a passionate sponsor of our climate risk work. We'll then have an excellent panel on addressing the insurance protection gap. This is also a key focus for the IAIS as it takes action to ensure the development of resilient insurance markets. The panel will be moderated by Gabrielle Bernardino, an IIS EXCO member and chairman of the European Insurance and Occupational Pensions Authority. All audience members throughout will be muted. However, you can ask the panelists questions using the question function. They won't appear on the screen, but they will be shown to the moderator and the panelists. We have over 570 people on the line today, which is a great turnout, and I look forward to the discussions. With that, over to you, Jeff. Thanks, Connor, and uh, I would also like to add my welcome to uh, all those that, that have joined the call today. Uh, so good morning to you, good afternoon, or as the case is here in Australia, uh, good evening. It's great to be with you and have an opportunity to moderate this important panel on embedding climate um, risk management in the insurance sector. Climate change is increasingly recognised as an overarching global threat with a wide range of impacts and implications for the structure and the function of the global economy and hence the financial system. As a result, there is growing financial risk for the resilience of all firms, including insurers. There is uh, not only risk, but also opportunity with the transition to, the low car to a low carbon future and also the um, uh, green recovery initiatives that are now under underway um, as a result of the pandemic. Climate financial risk is a key initiative, as you've just heard from Connor, for the IAIS. As many of you would know, uh, the IAIS, in partnership with the UN Convened Sustainable Insurance Forum, recently released for consultation an application paper on the supervision of climate risk in the insurance sector. This is a significant step because we are the first standard setting body to issue such guidance. The application paper follows two earlier information papers on the implications of climate risk for supervisors, published in 2018, and a second information paper, which was published earlier this year on the insurance sector's adoption of TCFD. The application paper outlines supervisory guidance in five key areas, ICP 99, supervisory review, ICP 7 on corporate governance, ICP 8 and 16 on risk management, ICP 15 on investments, and ICP 20 on disclosure. Three of these areas, corporate governance, risk management, and disclosure, will be the focus of uh, today's panel. So let me introduce our great panel to you. Aileen somerset Koki is the Chief Risk Officer globally for the Alliance Group, and we wish her a warm welcome. Olive uh, Slypen is Executive Director for the Dutch Central Bank, the DNB. And Ray Farmer is the president of the National Association of, Ins of Insurance Commissioners in North America and is also the commissioner for South Carolina. So welcome uh, to Aileen, Olive and Ray. Uh, can I start with, um, with moving to the role of corporate governance? Um, uh, in the application paper that has been published um, in section three of the paper, uh, this section looks at the oversight of management responsibilities, business objectives and strategies, the role of the board and the duties related to risk management and internal control controls as well as uh, remuneration um, through a climate lens with, um, with, with each of those uh, responsibilities. So can I start with you, uh, Aileen, as a, a global insurer? Um, and certainly a leader in this field, what have been some of the uh, challenges for Allianz uh, in thinking about governance as it relates to uh, climate uh, financial risk? I think 
Um, overall, um, in terms of our governance, uh, certainly uh, we represent um, environmental and uh, sustainable governance board as our kind of um, top uh, governing body for the sustainable related issues. Given the fact that we are um, a multi-line insurer um, in many countries in a relatively complex environment, obviously the overall coordination and governance becomes a little bit challenging. And this is why it becomes extremely important to have uh, this ESG board at the, at the highest board level, which is what we have. We have four um, board of management members um, in this board, as well as myself, and representatives from um, all the different functions, both in terms of uh, sustainability office, communication, but also key function holders like myself and compliance, etc. So I think that's really important to have that. And then um, this, this body, which actually has 40% of the board members uh, in it, is in acting as an advisor uh, to the board uh, to the board itself in terms of all the key decisions and all the activities um, that we are taking in the in the climate space. Now, um, in terms of the challenge, one challenge is well, how do you really integrate that into the inner workings um, of the organization? And we have recently set up cross-functional ESG task forces. I call it like ten of them, and these are. Uh, in integration of climate risk in underwriting into investments, environmental management, societal impact, regulation lobbying, uh, climate uh, risk disclosures, overall operating entity collaboration. So all of these are uh, having both um, local as well as group function and experts to really drive uh, these topics uh, forward. And we have the climate integration team, I think that's quite important, um, who is really working on early identification, measurement and business integration of risks, as well as the opportunities uh, arising from the climate change and low carbon transition. Now, we have integrated this quite effectively into our three lines of defense, both to the business, to the second line and the third line. Um, but I should also say that it is a challenge because this is a very evolving topic. It has short-term and very much longer-term implications with the physical risks, the chronic risk, acute risk, and the transitional risk that, uh, that are coming out of it. Therefore, I call this a living animal. You know, it's a, it's a governance that will evolve and it gets more and more integrated into also the incentive structure uh, that we are having. And what we also find important um, is to really ensure that the underwriting and the investment experts are also talking to each other from net cap and investment perspectives, because if um, the silo approach really leaves a lot of know-how kind of untouched. So that's one area where we are really ensuring that the underwriting know-how, for example, gets into evaluation of the investment know-how from a climate risk perspective. So okay. that's kind of a little bit long answer, but that's how we are <laughs> kind of set up, sorry. Can, can I can I ask a quick follow-up question? Um, that, that sounds very extensive. Um, uh, but um, what, what has been the driver of that? Is that response to regulation? Is it response to... Uh, is it a response to investor concerns, to 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 customers? I mean, what 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 is what has driven that uh, quite extensive response that you've outlined? Well, I mean, it's a it's a combination of quite a few things. I mean, we have we are also um, having uh, looking at all the emerging risks. So it's uh, I think it's uh, no surprise or no secret that you know there's uh, potentially even to tsunami coming our way and the. And as Angela Merkel put it, it's five minutes after 12. So I think the sense of urgency is, um, is definitely um, here. But from a regulatory perspective, from a customer perspective, when we look at all the stakeholders that we have, I think this, uh, this urgency is also increasing. And, and importantly, yes, there is, we will come to that probably. There's a lot of harmonization that needs to be done but we don't want to lose momentum and we don't want to be behind the curve. We want to be able to have as much impact 
as possible as early as possible. That's kind of what's driving it. Thank, thank you, Eileen. Ray, can I come to you? Um, what specific requirements does the NAIC have uh, for um, US firms as it relates to uh, to, to governance on, on climate risk? Thanks, Jeff, for, for the question. And before I answer that, I, I don't want to miss the opportunity to, to I, I know you're at the end of your term, uh, you know, in, in your current uh, uh, position, but I don't want to miss the opportunity to thank you for what you've done um, for the SIF or at IIS. Uh, you are a true champion of sustainability, a true environmental champion. And so I wish you well. And on behalf of the NEIC, thank you for all, all of your efforts. Um, but, uh, and, and we, we wish you well go, going forward. So, uh, but it, as to the question it, itself, well, there are no uh, currently no explicit governance requirements related to specifically to climate in, in the U.S. We do investigate the governance and oversight of uh, climate risk during our solvency monitoring process. Um, for, for, for example, climate risk may be discussed and disclosed in the ORSA filings, the corporate governance annual disclosure. And uh, through the Climate Risk Disclosure Survey that a number of states require to be completed on, on an annual basis. In addition, uh, an important element of our on-site corporate governance review is uh, interviews of the executives that are conducted during each examination. Uh, during these interviews, we ask questions regarding the governance of key risk exposures, uh, including those related to climate change. In, in fact, Jeff, there are specific questions related to climate change included in our interview questions for the chief investment officer and the chief risk officer. Thank you, Ray. Um, we'll come back and explore a bit more of that in a moment, I think. Um, uh, Olive, can I come to you? Um, how about uh, for the DNB, what, what specific requirements do you have uh, from a governance perspective of firms? Thank you, uh, Jeff, for the question. But before I answer it, I also would like to express my gratitude for the work that you've done for the IIS, but for the uh, for the CIF in particular. Um, and we met several times in that context, and it was always a great, great pleasure. And I hope to to see you again uh, in uh, in that in the context of sustainability. On your question, um, actually, maybe to set the scene a little bit, in the Netherlands, we. Um, do fit and proper testing of board members, supervisory board members, and we do it ex ante, so it's not exposed. So before board members or supervisory board members can be appointed, um, they should actually go through us, so to speak. And from next year onwards, we will uh, take into account their knowledge of, let's say, climate risk in relationship to the insurance company, of course. We will take that into account. That's going to be proportional, obviously, it depends on the size of the insurance company, the type of the insurance company. Uh, it may be more important for, let's say, uh, somebody like Aline uh, than for somebody else at maybe uh, 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 insurance company where it might not matter that much. Uh, but we, we, we definitely are going to look at it. And we also, because sometimes we also do interviews, uh, we will also, uh, let's say, um, put those uh, issues on the table when we interview um, people who are nominated for board positions. Uh, what we also do can I can I ask you on that? Are you sure. are you going to issue guidance on that? So how how you know, how does a prospective yeah, director yeah. know what good looks like? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, in general terms, in general terms, we have already done this, so this is not new. Uh, let's say to the sector, but of course, um, what we what we don't do, and we do that, we don't do that in in with with all kind of expertise. Uh, we don't actually issue exactly like this is what you need to know when you have this kind of function. It's very case specific. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, and it's not like uh, like learning learning uh, a book by heart. Right? That's not the point. But what the, the things we are in general terms, the things that we want to know that we expect uh, people to know about this particular risk is something that we have communicated already to the sector. Thank you. Thank you, Olive. Um, so let's move to um, uh, 
to to risk management and uh, because I'm keen to actually spend a fair chunk of our time on disclosure, which is a very hot topic. But uh, I'm, I want to address risk management uh, uh, next. Uh, uh, in section four of the application paper, risk management and internal controls is uh, are, are outlined in terms of the supervisory guidance, and it sets out requirements on systems, risk management and internal controls, including control functions. And this section provides guidance on how supervisors could integrate climate-related risks into their supervisory expectations around risk management and, uh, and other such functions. And staying with you, Olive, uh, you know, I... Do I understand that you are considering um, sort of some quantitative requirements as it relates to uh, risk management and scenario analysis with, with, with firms? And um, perhaps you could explain some of that. Yes. Um, first of all, what we've done actually already last year is issue a good practice to the industry about what we expect the industry uh, in terms of analyzing climate risks and, and also coming up with measures to mitigate those risks in the context of the ORSA, as Ray already just pointed out. We actually do the same. And uh, we, we already analyzed, let's say, a first batch of ORSAs, and about half of the insurance companies actually mentioned climate risk as a substantial risk. That was also kind of, and then it was also kind of elaborated further on in the ORSA. It's also kind of interesting to see that most insurance companies, they see climate risk mostly on the liability side, which is obvious at the, uh, in certain businesses. But sometimes they forget that it might also be an issue on the asset side of the balance sheet, depending on your asset mix. That's something that even where we would say you might have a risk uh, in that particular uh, field, they, they don't always see it. So I think a lot needs to be done here. Uh, here. But I, as I said, it was the first wave, basically, of ORSAs. Um, of course, we, we operate within the, uh, within the European Union context, and AOPA has recently um, issued an opinion on actually the use of scenarios that um, um, uh, insurance companies uh, should, uh, should use in this respect. And basically, one scenario is what if... Uh, measures to to counteract climate change are not going to work. So basically a two percentage plus scenario, uh, because then all kind of risks will definitely materialize like physical risks. It may have a huge impact on your on your portfolio, obviously, but also the other side. So what if measures are effective or measures are being taken that keep temperature, the increase in temperature below the two percent? Uh, because in that case, indeed, the transition risks uh, play an important role, and they already do. Eh? I mean, you only you, you only have to read the newspapers to see the um, uh, the depreciation of uh, oil and gas reserves that's already taking place, uh, partially because of the low oil price, obviously, but also uh, to some extent uh, because of uh, because of uh, let's say the climate change risks. So. Um, so that's basically, so what we are doing in this area very much, will will build, first of all, very much on what IOPA is doing. And we are also, of course, contributing to the work of IOPA quite extensively. Thank you, Olaf. Um, Eileen, I'll come to you. Um, uh, the, I mean, Alliance is a huge global firm. You operate in lots of different markets. How do you get consistency on on say some of the issues that Oliver's just uh, re referenced there in terms of modelling and uh, and other requirements? Now, uh, actually, modelling this is a challenging area. I should um, really say. Um, I mean, let me first say a little bit our approach, and then I can talk a little bit about uh, challenges. You know, we do rely on public reported data, and ideally. Um, audited climate-related data where possible. So we want to start with the facts. We are also developing our own approaches, like AI approaches, too, to source the climate-related data on our own. But we are, what's important is, I think, the, really analyzing the fundamental drivers of climate change instead of the pure detailed quantification. For example, how how um, do certain clearly observable trends like transition from coal to renewables, petrol to electric is really affecting our business? How do we respond strategically? We are also um, 
developing our own approaches to um, quantify um, the climate change risks and opportunities, kind of building in-house capacities. Uh, for example, it starts with simpler models and then we enhance these models as we have more scientific insights and our experience evolves. For example, we um, have had advances in climate modeling combined with you know, very high uh, resolution hazard maps that we developed within our reinsurance business and R&D. So we could really um, quantify uh, implications of quantum uh, in climate change in Germany, for example, for our flood exposure. So it's uh, so that really helps us to kind of um, further then integrate more perils, you know, and more uh, geographies in addition to that. And then, for example, for our investment management and uh, group risk, we have did this together. We have um, emission price stress test models for listed equity and corporate bonds. So on the asset side of the uh, balance sheet. So it leverages on our existing infrastructure on carbon foot, footprint reporting. And it's a relatively simplistic model, but it really allows to generate insights regarding impacts of short to medium term emission reduction, policy changes, etc. So these are kind of how, how we are approaching it. But it is challenging because yeah. um, the third party models are, you know, there's uh, the data quality is not necessarily good. And uh, the and also you have different sources with uh, uh, different data levels for these inconsistencies, I mean. And I think that kind of makes it difficult to really rely on the third party model providers. So I think that's, that's but I'm confident that's something that will evolve and uh, develop as, as science develops. So, Aileen, there is a lot of supervisors on this call, no doubt, and uh, uh, you know, you sound like you have. Got, there's a lot of sophistication in, in the group office, or uh, from from Alliance perspective in Munich. But uh, you know, how do I? What should be my expectation sitting here in Sydney about Alliance in Australia, or or any any of the other supervisors um, on this call? I mean, how do you see the consistency uh, across the, across the group in terms of rolling out that capability. And I guess that plays to, you know, some of the uh, proportionality issues that Oliver was referring to with, you know, the larger firms and the smaller firms. I mean, how do you think about that as a group? Uh, for us, in terms of, uh, for example, our geocoding, you know, this obviously starts with more material, larger OEs. We are also operating entities, uh, what OEs means. Um, and uh, and we are trying to extend it as much as possible because the overall models can be utilized globally. The issue, um, I think, is in terms of reporting requirements, different jurisdictions have different uh, requirements, also expectations. Now, I think there are Obviously, our hope is that we, you know, we would welcome efforts by standard setting bodies like uh, IAIS to harmonize risk management guidelines, you know, in collaboration with the sector um, uh, to, to, to really kind of get to more of a standardization, harmonization. But at the same time, you cannot just wait for this to kind of evolve your model. So I think it's it would be in the best interest of everybody to continue to evolve uh, the models and ensure that we are getting more and more grip on climate change risks into multiple perils and multiple uh, locations. And that's kind of what we are trying to build upon while in parallel hoping and supporting this uh, harmonization and standardization of reporting, stress testing, as well as disclosures. Thank you. Ray, in the US, um, you know, there is a requirement to uh, report all, all relevant and material risks in the ORSA, as you, you have said. Um, you know, how do you think the um, sophistication and evolution of, uh, of climate risk as it relates to the ORSA uh, is progressing across US firms? Um, you know, perhaps give us a view from what you see with some of the larger firms uh, to the mid-sized and smaller firms. And, 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 and from an NAIC point of view, is that where you want it to be? Sure. Uh, let, let me first follow up on something that, that Olaf was dis discussing. Uh, at, at the NEIC, we developed a climate re resiliency task force, and, and one of the work streams 
um, uh, on, on that will be um, uh, including developing climate risk stress test and scenario scenario analyses to evaluate potential exposures to both the fiscal and transition impacts of climate change. So if multiple jurisdictions are doing similar work on scenario analysis, uh, this could be an area where sharing of experiences and good practices would be benefit uh, to ensure supervisors of, of, around the globe. So on the, the ORSA piece, um, you know, U.S. ORSA requirements as described in uh, our NEIC guidance uh, manual require insurers to explain how they identify, how they access, monitor, prioritize, and report all material and relevant risk. To the extent that an insurer deems climate-related risk uh, material to its business strategy and questions, these risks uh, should be disclosed in the annual or sub summary report filed to the supervisor. Uh, the determination as to whether climate-related risk or material, uh, it's made in the first instance by the insurer and later reviewed by the supervisor. Uh, the supervisor certainly has the authority to require the insurer to incorporate climate uh, related risk in its ORSA and or re require changes in assumptions and scenarios utilized by the tour in, in, in this area. Ray, can I ask a cheeky question and um, and ask, you know, you know, how often do supervisors say to firms that actually we don't think that you are um, you are where you need to be as it relate to rate relates to climate risk. I mean, how often do you overrule the um, the firm as it relates to what they're disclosing in the ORSA around climate risk? Well, obviously, each individual company is, is separate. So, lo looking at at each company, uh, it, it it certainly happens. Uh, you know, from from time to time, that uh, we'll say. Uh, not only on, on climate-related risk, but other risks. You need to be in, including this and in, in paying attention to, to this area. So it, it certainly happens uh, on, on a regular basis. Thank you. Um, I want to move to, to disclosure, if we can, because um, yeah, this is, um, is, a, is a hot issue, and I think it's, uh, um, it's probably in the TCFD framework um, – you know, certainly larger, more sophisticated firms have made great progress around strategy, governance and risk management, but the issues on disclosure um, have been more challenging and there are a whole pile of good reasons for that, uh, taxonomy, standardised approaches, um, standard scenarios, stress tests, um, modelling capability, as you've heard from our panellists. Um, uh, so, and we also found in the information paper that the IAS and the SIF published earlier this year that... Um, uh, while 75% uh, of firms, uh, by number, there were some 1,300 firms in the survey said that climate was material to their business, only about 24% uh, of firms were actually, uh, you know, doing, uh, you know, taking action to address that issue. And um, certainly the larger, more sophisticated firms were doing that. But there was a long tail of firms that uh, it was more difficult to see uh, uh, progress on, on, on the issue. So, um, I think this is a good area to spend a, a fair chunk of time on. Uh, so in the application paper, Section 7, uh, ICP 20, um, requires firms to uh, uh, disclose relevant and comprehensive information in a timely manner in order to give policyholders and market participants a clear view of their business activities, risks, performance and financial position, which uh, therefore enhances market discipline. Um, and so in the application paper, as indeed the issues paper, it's it's mapping climate risk back into uh, into ICP20 and those uh, those requirements. Um, so Ray, staying with you um, on disclosure, um, the NIAC, NIAC does have a disclosure regime in place for in insurers, as, as I understand it. Um, you know, so what sort of information is, and that's been going for some time, as I understand it. So uh, I think even before the TCFD came out. So, so what sort of information are firms asked to disclose uh, in that? Um, it's it's an annual survey that you run. Is that correct? Yes, uh, Jeff. The climate risk disclosure survey was adopted by the NEIC in, in two thousand and ten. 
Uh, currently, the uh, survey is being administered in a multi-state initiative that includes six states, uh, briefly California, Connecticut, Minnesota, New York, New Mexico, and Washington State. My memory is working this morning. Uh, the survey has eight questions. Ask insurers to provide a description of how they incorporate climate risk into their mitigation, risk management, uh, investment, business plans, and identify steps that uh, take it to engage key, key constituencies and policyholders on the topic of climate risk. Uh, re responses are collected annually from non-life or property casualty uh, companies, uh, life and health insurance companies in, in the six participating states with direct written premiums over $100 million. Uh, this equates to about 1,200 individual uh, insurers representing uh, uh, over 70% of the U.S. direct written premium. Annual responses are then organized into a publicly accessible database located it, uh, on the California Department of Insurance web website. Uh, so for the reporting year of 2019, uh, NEIC Climate Risk Disclosure Survey due from insurers this past August, uh, participating insurers were allowed to submit a TCFD report in lieu of the NEIC Climate Disclosure Survey. So eight groups and eight inv individual insurers submitted a, a TCFD report in the reporting year for 2019. But uh, insurance companies are increasingly moving toward climate disclosures that are consistent uh, across financial in institutions. Uh, given a global shift toward adopting TCFD guidelines, um, the NEIC Climate Resiliency Task Force that I briefly mentioned earlier is considering appropriate climate risk disclosures uh, within the insurance sector and may decide to explore further aligning the NEIC climate survey with the TCFD in, in the coming years. Um, for example, all, all, although the current survey is a series of yes, no questions, there is substantial uh, a substantial uh, narrative accompanied with each response and it's onerous for supervisors to interpret uh, those results. So there are modifications to be considered that could help with the TCFD alignment and pro promote uniformity in reporting uh, requirements. Additionally, later today, in about eight, eight or nine hours or so, um, this task force is going to meet and hear from two organizations, uh, the American Academy of Actuaries and the NEIC's Center for Insurance Policy and Research regarding separate research projects uh, to evaluate the NEIC climate risk disclosure data. Um, relatedly, the NEIC recently released on its website findings from its first analysis of the 2018 Climate Risk Disclosure Survey. Uh, the analysis found uh, that reported engagement with climate risk mitigation acti activities is up. But, um, you know, as always, there's certainly more room for improvement across the industry. That was a little bit longer answer than you probably wanted, Jeff, but that, that's where we are. It's a, a very thorough answer, Ray, so thank you. Um, I appreciate that. Um, Olive, uh, back to you. Um, you know, the, the big debate is around um, regulatory nudge or should it be mandatory? Um, a number of jurisdictions globally uh, have already announced a mandatory disclosure in line with T TCFD. Um, the UK, uh, the, the, the Swiss for larger firms down in my part of the world uh, uh, our, our friends across the Tasman, the Kiwis, the New Zealanders have, have announced uh, this, and a lot of that's happening quite quite soon. Um, what is what's the position in the Netherlands on uh, on disclosure and 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 the notion of mandatory or otherwise? I would say uh, I think it's very important that we move uh, forward with this. Um, to answer your question directly, it's not mandatory yet in the Netherlands, but I think it should. And not only in the Netherlands, I think uh, we need to uh, embark on a truly a global initiative here uh, and also to come to some kind of harmonization of reporting requirements. Um, and uh, what we see now is that in particular, the larger insurance companies, they're, they're clearly ahead of the smaller ones, but they're all developing their own uh, methodologies, not completely true. 
uh, in the sense that uh, they, they all talk to each other and there are a lot of, let's say, market uh, or consultants and providers of these kind of services that help as well. But in general, you know, um, yeah, it's, it's up to them. Uh, but this is costly. Uh, this is a costly process if you have no kind of harmonized uh, reporting. Uh, at the same time, uh, the smaller insurance companies, they don't have the resources to, let's say, develop their own standards. So I think um, we've done quite a lot in terms of risk management. Uh, we've, we're not there yet. I would be very much in favor, indeed, of, and that process is ongoing, uh, that also in, in the, uh, the regulatory supervisory standards, we come to some degree of harmonization. And I think the IIS papers that were written or produced together with the CIF are a very good first step in, in that direction, but I think we should go beyond that. And now the next step is also to look at reporting, reporter requirements, disclosure. Um, we're quite happy that also there's now an IFRS consultation ongoing. Uh, I think this is also where the place where it should be because it's we're not only talking about information or disclosure from financial institutions, but also non-financial institutions, because very often, you know, the, the, the insurance companies need that kind of information if they are a major uh, investor and also to manage their, their, their risks. Um, I would, however, let's say, I think it's important also to, to, to tell our colleagues working in that particular area that there's really a sense of urgency and speed is of the essence here. And Let's say on some IFRS, uh, it took years and years and years and years before we had anything, um, you know, and I think we really need to have something quick uh, here. And I think there's already a lot out there, uh, which uh, let's say the, the reporting experts can, uh, uh, can, can use. I also know that indeed Mark Carney, uh, we all know him. He's now the uh, special uh, UN envoy. Uh, working towards the uh, the COP uh, in Glasgow next year, uh, and he's. I think it's also one of his major issues. Um, the the not only reporting, but also the harmonisation of reporting requirements. So, uh, in in summary, you you think there is both urgency and a degree of inevitability about um, uh, about convergence towards a, a global standard. The question is just who would who would that come from and uh, yeah, and and when would it occur? That's a nice summary of my intervention, which might be too long. Thank you. Alan, <laughs> uh, back back to you. So, um, you, you know what what has been impressive in recent years is that um, there is a lot of initiatives going on at firm level. Um, you know, industry groups have come together in many jurisdictions to develop. Uh, um, you know, modelling standards, uh, climate measurement, um, you know, there's whether they be sort of industry associations or groups of, of, of like-minded firms. I know Alliance has been involved in leading some of that effort. Um, how do you view, um, you know, the firm-led, industry-led versus standard setter? You know, how should all this come together so that we can have you know, appropriate comparable uh, market uh, rated disclosures uh, firm by firm. Thank you very much. Um, I, actually, um, I really concur with what Olaf said in terms of um, a sense of urgency, the need for standardization, um, but also kind of keeping going, you know, and I think the answer to your question is a little bit of a combination um, of both because uh, of all, all three. You know, there are external challenges we are facing with the data quality, availability, um, especially on value chain emissions, exposure to physical risks. We have uh, developmental uh, challenges on the climate um, change risk models and commercial tools are still a bit intransparent. So, I think from one perspective, in terms of um, if we have an international standardization of non-financial reporting with a high degree of comparability, and, and here obviously you have to take into consideration the, the resources that the smaller insurance companies can put into play, and I think that you know, common denominator needs to be found, and this could very well be done under the umbrella of the IFRS Foundation, for example. But 
we do still face some kind of a misalignment uh, of disclosure, disclosure requirements also at the European level. And we also have some timeline mismatches across the different legislations. And I think to mitigate uh, the compliance and liability risks, it would be really good, and I think as the industry we're striving for, is to have a phased-in approach of, of requirements in combination with a you know, re reasonable best effort solution. I think that's that would be a, a, a really kind of reasonable way um, to go about it. And still, you know, we have um, internal challenges in terms of, I mean, our own, although we are a very big insurance company, we still have challenges in terms of uh, the, how the OEs do their reporting uh, with the different uh, local requirements. But what we do is, you know, in order to ensure consistency, we have a board mandate and approach, clear level of responsibilities, using the industry-specific guidelines, and we realize it's a journey. You know, we are very ambitious, but it's a journey with progress over time, and we start with the tools we are confident with, and then we don't simply buy, you know, just third-party uh, products, but we open kind of be open about the challenges to look at uh, longer term solution avenues and really engage on improving data quality i think we are, if we're able to improve data quality it will be much easier to set really uh, the data standards as well so as a, as a publicly listed company i mean you're dealing with investors all the time and those investors are speaking to um, the equivalent of a growing band of climate uh, like ratings agencies who are rating performance of different firms and um, you know how when you're out in the market talking to investors how do you find the quality of that information that comes from those climate ratings of measurement or taxonomy at this point Jeff, you got cut off uh, just for, you got cut off the last 10 seconds. Did Jeff cut off or? Yes. Okay. Can, well, can you hear me now? Yes, Jeff, I can hear you now. I think you were, um, asking um, a little bit about how do we find the data quality and what our investors are kind of questioning, right? Bye. Maybe um, I can talk a little bit about that. Um, basically, you know, it's certainly, you know, we are, um, we do find publicly available data. It's not that it's not uh, available at all. But um, and and we are seeing, you know, some, um, you know, we are making use of all the aligned matrix and taxonomy in terms of uh, uh, GHG emissions, you know, split by scope categories. We can really um, uh, look into, um, you know, measure, you know, how we are reducing our own carbon footprint. Obviously, this is not the only thing, you know, the Dow Jones index, for example, is extremely comprehensive. So there are, uh, you can quantify much more, I think, the, you know, carbon emission related data. You can also quantify, especially within our investment portfolio, and that's what we are focusing on also with the Asset Owner Alliance, uh, you know, what we can do within our investor portfolio on the asset side of the balance sheet. So, for example, the Asset Owner Alliance has develop principle for an ideal methodology, you know, the members are willing to develop approaches. I think this part will uh, become stronger and stronger. I think in terms of governance, we do have good examples, and I would count ourselves uh, as one of those examples. Um, and But I think, as I said, the, the governance needs to evolve in terms of impact. And, you know, climate risk cannot be seen in its vacuum. It has huge confluence effect on all the other risks that we kind of live and breathe, liquidity risk, market risk, 
uh, you know, the reputation is both non-financial and financial side. So as, as its impact is more uh, quantified, I think we'll be able to see these links and be able to also report on this. And this will impact the governance as well. So it's a little bit of a virtuous cycle, I hope, in terms of, uh, in terms of really creating the impact. And that's what matters in the end. So uh, uh, thank you, Aileen. Um, on on those broad, those interrelated risks, uh, Olive, uh, I know that uh, the DNB has been looking at biodiversity, and we have uh, also been talking about that at the Sustainable Insurance Forum. Um, you know, how do you see disclosure of nature based other nature based risks uh, in this 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 I guess continuum of uh, of disclosure and and um, risk maturity. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Jeff. First of all, I I think it's very good that uh, indeed the Sustainable Insurance Forum has decided to. Uh, I, I read the uh, what is it the 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 release the information that you send out on looking at biodiversity. Um, first of all, I think it's good because you know we had this discussion also when we started. To think about climate risk and <clears throat> I'm pretty sure a lot of people will ask themselves the question what is this biodiversity um, what are these regulators supervisors central banks doing the point is that all these kinds of risks can be translated into financial risks and I think that's exactly the point so and then it becomes uh, uh, let's say a real risk also for uh, indeed uh, uh, risk managers um, how does it work with biodiversity or the loss of biodiversity uh, if measures uh, would be taken? First of all, if measures would be taken and there's a, a, a huge summit or huge, but there's a summit uh, next year in China to discuss biodiversity and standards for biodiversity. If measures would be taken that kind of firms and not only talking about insurance firms, but also other firms kind of force to take measures um, to let's say, do something regarding their uh, exposure towards uh, risking uh, biodiversity, it will harm the value of that company or it will harm the business model of that company. So if you are an insurance company and if you have exposure to that kind of company, um, you run a risk. It's the same like when you are heavily invested in, let's say, um, fossil fuels. So there's there's an analogy which you can, can, can draw. Um, uh, and uh, and I think this is exactly what we try to do. With we indeed we published a report called "Indebted to Nature," first of all, which tries to to outline what are exactly those risks, uh, or tries to to translate loss of biodiversity into financial risks for banks, insurance companies, and pension funds, and then tries to come up with an estimate uh, of a first estimate of how at least how large the risk might be and indeed what we have asked uh, financial institutions in the netherlands is next to climate risk it is something that is so material please put it on your list list of at least risks that you should look at look at when you're doing your uh, uh, your risk assessment um, and actually also in the netherlands financial institutions uh, have taken that up and they have together said you know, indeed, this is something we really want to take uh, seriously. And I think, yeah, you, 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 you are very, very well into to this topic as well. It's always impossible, or it's always uh, important to explain that we are not, we're not doing this with, let's say, political agenda or whatever. That's not our aim. And that's also not our role. But we try to translate certain risks that we see into uh, which which appear to be non-financial in, let's say, uh, balance sheet risks. And they are real and they can sometimes be quite big. Hmm. I mean, there is, a, Olive, there is a question to that very subject uh, that's come through from the audience about, you know, shouldn't regulators be sticking to, um, in our case, insurance risk and uh, why are we looking at these risks? So I, I guess your answer to that would be, you, you, it actually does flow through to mandates. I, I know the um, uh, that's been the case with the NGFS, uh, which is on the banking side as well, and uh, central banks. And um, do you want to just make some brief comments about uh, that challenge about uh, are, how do these issues relate to um, 
an insurance regulator's responsibility. I, I, uh, uh, indeed, uh, I, I understand the question, uh, by the way, but indeed, as I said, uh, those risks have economic consequences. And I think um, just like we are now in the middle of a pandemic, a pandemic, it's not a financial risk. It's a, it's a medical emergency, but it has clearly economic and financial consequences. This is the same. Now, climate risk is also... Uh, it's not a financial risk as such, but it might happen. Uh, actually, it is already happening. And it is going to have, in one way or the other, economic consequences. It's going to have consequences for financial stability. And one way or the other, either because governments are taking measures to avoid the uh, the increase in, in uh, uh, let's say, the, the, the average temperature, or because they fail to do so, or they're not able to do it sufficiently, and then we will see, you know, changes in weather, flooding, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this is exactly, I think, also where insurance companies come in, both on the liability side as on the asset side. Uh, and uh, so these are things you have to take into account when you're managing managing your risks. And very often we have said, you know, it's long term, you know, and why should we care about something that's going to happen? Uh, in the in the in the in the future, in the far future, as I said, and, and if you look at the evidence, I'm not so sure whether it's that long term. It's already happening sure. now. Uh, if you look at weather events, if you look at uh, uh, the, the the valuation issues, uh, in, in when when we talk about stranded assets, it's already happening out now, and maybe much faster than uh, we even thought a couple of years ago. So sure. I think it's at the heart of our mandate. Hmm. Thank you. Um, Ray, a, a question that's come through um, dealing with uh, skills of supervisors. Um, Aileen has spoken at some length about the, the efforts that Alliance has been doing to improve their capability. Um, you know, how as supervisors do we respond to um, the, the expertise in, in this, what is a, is a new uh, emerging, emerged, accelerating risk, which is challenging, um, you know, not only firms, but challenging capability within with insurance uh, supervisory agencies. Uh, how is the uh, NAIC thinking about skilling up its members? It's a great, great question. Let me follow up on what Olaf said. Um, I, I think the risk is is here. All all you have to do is, is kind of look in this country where, where um, we have more flooding uh, sea levels rising. We have uh, some of our towns on, on in the coastal areas that um, you know when it uh, when it's cloudy, it looks like it's flooding. So um, uh, you know the, the the risk is here today. Uh, it, this is uh, certainly a long term uh, risk, but it's uh, it it's certainly uh, uh, a, a current risk as, as well. So the NEIC continues its educational efforts. Um, you know, we have uh, on, ongoing for each state, each regulator, um, uh, a, a continuing educational uh, program. We have um, uh, once a year, we have a, what we call an insurance summit where we look at uh, several different, uh, a number of different uh, uh, categories and, and issues and, and drill down and uh, um, continue in our, our educational process. We also, uh, as regulators, we require, um, you know, our employees, our, our uh, regulators to continue their education, continue to get designations uh, to, to keep current with, uh, you know, not only these, these risks, but, but others as well. So it's a continuing process, just like it is for, for the industry. Thank you, Ray. Um, we're, we're getting close to time, and I want to just finish with a, uh, a question, perhaps for, for, for each of you, um, which, I, which I'll cycle through. I see we've got about five minutes left, so if you can keep that in mind with, it, with your response. Um, but Ray, I'll stay with you and ask, ask you first. Um, uh, yeah, again, a cheeky question. Um, uh, but, you know, there's an, uh, an incoming new administration in, in your, your country. Um, those that are interested in the climate debate have, uh, have watched uh, US politics very closely because there has been quite a, um, you, know, you know, a difference of views. Um, uh, yeah, you know, how do you see that influencing your work and um, and and in, and insurance firms, um, the new administration? 
Well, in, in two areas. Before before we get to the new administration, you know, the NEIC itself has been studying the impact of climate risk for, for a number of years. And, and so we've established this uh, executive level task force that I, I mentioned earlier. Uh, that's going to be the vehicle for all climate related decisions uh, go, going forward over all of our uh, different committees. Um, that task force has five different work streams from solvency to climate risk disclosures to pre-disaster mitigation and innovation and, and, and te technology. And, and so that work is, is kicking off uh, and, and progressing. But, you know, we certainly strive to ensure we're at the forefront of the thought leadership and action on the crit this critical issue. Uh, at the federal level, President-elect Biden recently appointed Secretary of State John Kerry uh, uh, as his special envoy for climate underscoring the importance of the new administration will likely uh, place on, on, on this issue. Uh, also, with regard to federal regulatory environments, last month in its semi-annual report on financial stability, the Federal Reserve, for the first time, highlighted climate risk as a potential risk to the stability of the financial system and said it's working to better un understand that, that, that risk. Yeah, they they are all significant developments, and um, uh, I'm you know I'm I'm sure they'll have a, a an impact on you on your work. So thank thank you for that. Um, uh, all of uh, 2021 is a is a cop year. Um, Europe has been uh, you know at the vanguard of a lot of this work on climate climate risk. Um, you know it's uh, you know what do you think of the expectations around? COP uh, COP twenty six in Glasgow in uh, November twenty one. You know, ha how do you see next year p playing out in terms of the development of things like standards, guidance, um, you know, the, the general alignment globally on on climate related risks. Yeah. No, I think it's going to be a very important meeting, and I'm also quite optimistic. Uh, first of all, I mean, uh, just listen to what Ray was saying. I mean. Everything he's been saying was like music in my ears uh, today. So uh, that was he made my day um, uh, when it comes to this uh, to this topic. But uh, also, uh, as we know, uh, it's not only in the U.S. but also in other parts of the world, uh, things are moving in this direction or in the, the right direction. Uh, and uh, and so I have I have uh, high hopes, but I think it's also necessary that we take. Um, let's say subsequent uh, subsequent steps, in particular, indeed, in the area of reporting. Um, and uh, yeah, we 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 need to take uh, we take we need to take the next uh, the next steps for sure. And again, uh, it's not because I mean that's fine, you know. But this is an, on another plate. Uh, um, it, it has nothing to do with 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 politics or whatever. It's just looking at facts. And what do they mean for the financial industry and for economics? And that's our job as regulators, as you know, uh, central banks, but also indeed as members, uh, as financial institutions. And I think this is, and there's really a big problem out there. Thank you, Olive. And uh, Aileen, last word for you. Um, uh, Allianz has, has certainly been. Uh, you're leading in many areas. Uh, your group CEO Oliver Beatty has uh, been, you know, been at the forefront of this. Uh, where, where, from a, a corporate sense, does Alliance want to be in, say, uh, 24 months' uh, time? I, we have uh, we have a pretty clear net investment portfolio commitment. So we have committed to decarbonize our proprietary investment portfolio by uh, with uh, to a net zero emissions by 2050. We have also together um, uh, within the UN Convention, the Asset um, Owner Alliance, we have started as 30 members now, more than 5 trillion of uh, assets. So, and in Q1, this is uh, in 2021, we will announce our five-year uh, targets. So I think from all overall, uh, we have a shorter term in five-year targets is basically 25% reduction in our uh, emissions. And in the meantime, in the next 24 months, we, are work, we will continue to work on uh, expanding our scenario analysis, you know, really 
improve our societal impact and really move from leading to really hopefully shaping uh, these discussions. That would be our ambition. Well, thank you very much, uh, Aileen. Thank you, Olive, and thank you, Ray. Um, I thought that was a great discussion. Um, before we uh, before we close out, can I just again um, uh, remind you about the uh, the application paper that um, that has been released for public consultation? We certainly would welcome input from everybody on this call. Uh, it's open for consultation till uh, January uh, next year. Um, a great effort by the Sustainable Insurance Forum and the Global Standard Setting Body for Insurance, the IAIS, and um, we would welcome your input in helping to shape uh, that, that paper. But uh, for now, that's all of us, uh, all from us. Uh, so again, uh, thank you to Aileen, Olive and, and Ray, and uh, it was a great pleasure to host this panel. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you very thank much. You, Jeff. Thank you very much, Jeff. And thank you, Ray, Olaf, Aileen. Uh, it was an excellent panel uh, on an issue that's really at the core of uh, the IIS's work. Uh, we've spent a lot of time over the last couple of years looking at it, and no small part that's been uh, due to Jeff's leadership. Um, I want to thank Jeff again for moderating this panel, but also uh, for the commitment and the energy that he's put into the topic over the last few years. Um, unfortunately, uh, his meeting on Wednesday was the last EXCO meeting for him. Um, but uh, I know uh, that the leadership he's shown on this issue, uh, the work that he's done and the commitment that he's, he's made uh, is going to far outlast his uh, contributions to the IIS over the last couple of years. 